welcome back, dear friends. How lovely. Laser cutting with jigs, you say? I'll see what I can do. Here's the 3D printed enclosure for the Kraken gauge. Hold on a minute. That looks like that. And it's got a little motor on the back. And when you put three volts into it, it moves all the gears and sweeps the arm. That was a backwards and forwards across the, uh, the gauge readout, the legend. However, I did design one that used a little servo motor on the back. It still had the moving gears, but had a servo motor, so you could move the pointer and get it to actually show you a real measurement. But it needed a slot cut out for the servo motors. I didn't want to redesign another one of these, um, and anywhere the file was cropped. I can't actually do anything. I've tried improving it, but it's just cropped, and it won't let me design it anymore. So I'm stuck with this version. So it's easier just to cut a hole with the laser cutter. But how to position it, dear friends? With a jig, of course. This is one of my favourite jigs, I have to say, because again, it's so simple, and it makes a virtually impossible job not impossible, or even possible. It sits in the corner, so I now know, because this is the datum when you uh, point from the laser cutter when it's first switched on, sits in the corner, I focused it on the top of this little block of wood, I get one of my things that are plain and push it in and it lines up with a little engaging slot there. I've drawn that so I know which way round it goes. I do that, I shut the lid and I click go. And it goes. Look at that. Pull that out. Why is everything so difficult when the when the camera's on? And there we have it. Perfect. Right, I'll get on and get the rest of the ten of them done. The other thing I'm doing today is to turn one of these standard voltmeters, which I'll put the number on the screen. I got them on eBay, and I've been getting them for some time. Um, standard voltmeters into something which I can use in that hole there. Oh, hello! To tell the um, barometric pressure readings. And here we have it. Part way through, progressing nicely. Thing is, as always, oh, it's just sod's law. Lovely drawings showing, illustrating quite clearly what I need to do. And I was sitting here, having taken the, uh, this one to pieces, thinking, what? Well, am I going mad? What on earth is happening? Because it didn't add up what I was seeing. And then I realised very, very slowly that they've changed the design. They used to have a sort of plastic thing here that would support the gauge's movement and everything, and now they've replaced it with a horrible moulding that sticks onto the back of the gauge's enclosure. Took me ages to figure it out. Anyway, I then figured out, and I can't show you because I've just glued it all together, but I've taken, pulled the metal ring out of here, the sort of magnetic screen ring thing. It just pulled out really easily. I've redesigned this bit, which is that bit, so the hole is slightly smaller, and I've glued the ring into it. It's perfect. Um, needless to say, you know, I used to I 3D printed this cap that would fit over the back of it to protect the mo movement, and that doesn't work now, so I'm going to have to redesign that, but for the time being I've just stuck a bit of pipe on. Now the next thing is to illuminate, provide illumination, because there's nothing like a lovely glowing gauge. I'll get on with that and get back to you. So the way I discovered of illuminating these gauges, two little bits of uh, Vera board, seven by two holes, a very small, one of those um, very small surface mount LEDs off one of those flexible strips, desolder it and solder it on there. They then poke through the holes and shine light across the top of the gauge over the dial and it looks lovely because they're hidden behind this front bit, this extra bit that I've cut out. I'll show you what I mean. It really is a lot cheaper to get your LEDs, your warm white LEDs as strips. It's dirt cheap rather than buying them as separate components. I have now unsoldered two of them and I've cut up two little pieces of the Vera board, 7x2. I'm going to solder them onto the tops. There we are, that's soldered on. 
a little bit fiddly, not too bad. And here's one working. Oh well. So useful. And the great thing about these little LEDs is they've got a 180 degree spread, whereas all the ones, because it took ages to work out how to do this, I experimented with all sorts of other standard 3mm and 5mm LEDs, so even ones with sort of conical lenses on the, on the front, but none of them came nearly close to these ones with the just the ability to illuminate everything in front. They'd all produce a sort of beam start type thing. Right, let's get them fixed into the slots. No, that's absolutely fine. A titchy bit of shadow, but not much, and it's just this lovely even spread of light. Just looks so nice. Thank goodness for common sense. I've just realised that by sanding the back off this to make it thinner, it now sits perfectly flush against the dial and supports it the right distance inside. Like so, that's much better. Oh, thank goodness for that. And there we have it. The joy of the drill tap. You, I do take it out regularly just to clear the swarf because it's, you know, it melts at a low temperature. But it does, it's lovely. And the great thing about drilling the holes first, 3.3 mil for the holes for tapping M4, is it means that when you put the tap in, you know it's going to be guided perfectly perpendicularly, which is nice too. So we've got some lovely new bits made up. There's this bit, which is for the knob to control the function switch with a little wooden knob on the top, which is nice. There's the bit that holds the pulley over the spinning pulley gear underneath for the chain to return back to the motor. There's the lovely, I do like this, I was so pleased I ended up doing that design. Reminiscent of musical instrument bridges, just because it adds a je ne sais quoi. Again, they've all tapped and everything. And then there's this strange part. Always wanted to have a curved sign. Like you used to see in old fashioned dimmers, that's right, theatrical stage dimmers. They used to have an, an old, that's right, early sound mixing desks as well. They had curved things because I suppose they had the knob that was having to turn a variable resistor inside. That's what this is. So I'm going to have plenty of super glue on there and then I'll stand here and hold that. And then that allows the switch to pass over the top. Um, and the same radius, I think. Oh, right. Get them sprayed up. An interesting sculpture, I hear you cry. No! I've just sprayed up the two parts that make the window at the front to view the lens and the weather scenes. It's always fascinating spraying sheets of acrylic because I hoover them religiously and inspect them for little bits of dust and specks of things and I paint them and inevitably find out there are specks of dust just where you really don't want them, in the most visible place. There's even the wooden knob to stain and polish that goes on top of the control lever. I've got it all wired up and glued together. I'll be able to fall and I've set it so that when it's vertical it points to the lowest figure. If you lie it down, then the, the weight all changes on the um, movement, and then it doesn't point to zero. So it's always important to remember to set it to zero when it is in the final position. And you do that by turning that, adjusting that little um, screw thing just below the meter. So, wiring it up, got it all connected up to a lovely little connector, which really does make it so much easier just to and put all this together to assemble it, having it being able to plug in. So there's the two resistors to the two LEDs, and the ground for the LEDs, and then on this little circuit board, that's what takes the pulse width modulated output from one of the Arduino pins and turns it into a voltage that will run the meter, the actual meter movement. Now meter movements are interesting. Here's the original dial, I set it read up to 50 volts. And that's great. Equally, the manufacturers of this movement and these meters could, by adding a different value resistor in series with the movement, 
could get it to read virtually within reason any voltage or by lowering the resistance get it to read much lower voltages or by wiring a resistor across in, in parallel with the movement get it to read currents as well so that's how you do it but when you strip away everything from these movements then moving coil movements I should add um, they're very very sensitive and what I found just by through experimenting with this using a pulse width modulated output from the Arduino which is which you can tell to switch on and off at different duty cycles so it's on more than off or on off more than on per cycle running it through a 1K resistor having a smoothing capacitor a 1 microfarad one and a 3K3 3300 ohm resistor then the meter down to 0 volts it works a treat. Now obviously before I connect this up, well I'm going to connect up, but before I first switch the Arduino on I'm going to set it, just to test it and to set it up to say 100, it goes up to 255 on the pulse width modulated output settings on the Arduino so I'm going to start about 100 and see how far across this goes because I don't want it to possibly be more sensitive than I was expecting to slam hard right across and possibly damage itself so I start at 100 and then just ease it up until I find what number gets the pointer to point at 1040 then I can use the map command one of the very useful commands that come functions should I say that comes with the Arduino system um, just to say okay the lowest one is naught the maximum is whatever number it is and this is what the two sort of range I'm going to be feeding in can you do the maths for me and it will which is lovely so what I'm going to do next thing is now I've got all the wiring done so theoretically I can put that in connect everything up and see what happens because I don't actually everything over this side the chimes they're purely mechanical I don't well, I do need this to move actually, because that's got the sensors on, isn't it? So the Arduino knows where to move this to, to which sink. Oh, that's annoying, because the wretched bearings still haven't arrived. They're going to go in the top of that and in the bottom of that. 6mm internal, 13 or 12 out, and 5 or 4 or something thick. And then that is going to sit on there, if you remember. So that I can adjust it from the back to get the tension of the chain right. And, oh, and the gears are lined properly, more importantly, and that's right. And I've been waiting a whole week now. Doesn't sound long, but I'm... Oh, yeah, some of the people, companies I've ordered stuff from, the next day or a couple of days, and it's now, in fact, it's over a week now. Who did I order them off? It was Technobox Online. They're a good company, but they always do seem to take ages to deliver things. That's interesting, isn't it? Well, you've got x-ray vision, you can see right through it from the inside. Oh, and there's the piece of wood that goes on the front of the bit I've just sprung up for the window. So that's, that's nice. Oh, and look, shiny thing, aren't they beautiful? I'm amazed at this paint, this, uh, was it Plastico, metallic brass paint. It was when I have been, when I've done um, steampunk events in the past, I had all the machines there. People have said, how do you cut such intricate shapes from brass? Um, and they couldn't believe it, standing right up close to it, looking at them, that it wasn't actually brass. It is amazing stuff. Oh yeah, I meant to add how I glued this together, this back bit in. <laughs> As you can probably see, it's not super glue. I used LSX, Fernox LSX. I love this stuff. I've mentioned it many times before. It's a plumbing sealant. And when I did all the plumbing and everything in the house, used to smear this on the compression joints if I was using them and then tighten them and it would be really solid and it is such a good sealant that it, it, as an example it says if you've got a leaking radiator get a coin put a bit of this on it don't have to switch the heating off or drain the system stick it over the hole and the water will help it to cure quickly and it's so tough and strong and brilliant I love it and it's also very good because it sticks anything to anything it's not particularly attractive as you can see but then function in this case is far more important than aesthetics. Now I used it, smeared it around the back because I wanted to have the opportunity to perhaps have to cut this apart and open it and if I'd done it with super glue there's no way and there's not really room for screws and mechanical fixing so I thought I'd try that just in case 
a lump of black plastic or something just happened to end up exactly where I didn't want it. So, another top tip. That's lovely. There's no blemishes on that after a first coat, but how did I know? There's a big blodge there, and this is the outer window frame. Big blob there, and another speck somewhere over there, so I'm going to have to get me 1,000 grade, which I'm so pleased I ended up getting. With 400 grade, it's too coarse, and you end up sanding off lots of paint and leaving scratches that are big enough to be picked up after you've sprayed another paint coat on. But with a 1,000 grade, you can just sand a little lump off, spray it straight away, and there won't be any sign it ever existed. Let's talk desoldering, dear friends. I've got that, which is the Teensy and the Teensy soundboard, which doesn't work partly. It's very important part, it just doesn't work properly, so I can't get it to function. So I need to unsolder. Yeah, you see it. This bit from this bit, which I soldered together with two rows of these header pins, as was suggested. Very tricky thing to do without damaging and wrecking everything, but it doesn't work so it can't get much worse. Now, generally, when you desolder, you can do it in two ways. There's this, which is desoldering braid. It's copper um, braid soaked with flux or impregnated with flux. And the idea is that co um, solder cannot resist nicely fluxed copper. So you hold this against the joint, you heat up the soldering iron, all the solder gets sucked off and the joint ends up here. Problem is, because I've got two joints, I've got the top one and I've got the bottom one, that's not going to work, it's just going to end up as a complete and utter shambles. And obviously sometimes it needs an awful lot of heat and I don't want to risk damaging it. The other way, the friends, this is one of these, I've had this a very long time as well, it's called a solder sucker. And you heat up the joint you want to desolder, you put this Teflon tip as close to it as possible while it's still hot and the solder's still melted, you press the button and it works remarkably well, it sucks it all up, but again, that's no good. So what I'm going to have to resort to is some sort of more physical approach, shall we say. Let's give it a go, see how it goes. I found the best way to do it is to try and get rid of the... There we are. It wasn't too bad, considering it's soldered in two places. The difficult bit is getting rid of this um, the, the header joined plastic bit. Um, I'm going to chip it away with a scalpel and then try and break off the end so I can actually get heat to the middle. If you get heat just at this end, it doesn't travel far enough up. What sort of physical damage I'm doing to it, I have absolutely no idea. But the rationale being, it doesn't work, so it can't get much worse. Now it's time to start on the chime mechanism. Very interesting designing this because obviously it needs to go both ways so it can play a rising pitch and a falling pitch to indicate whether the barometric pressure is rising or falling, e.g. whether the weather is improving or getting worse. So I've cut out all the lovely parts, lots and lots of lovely parts, and for each of the lovely parts, or lots of them, I always sand one side flat on the sanding machine and sand the edges because to remove that slight draft angle that was caused by the laser cutting. And then with lots of these parts, I have to then machine holes in them, as is this, and cut taps, or tap threads even, which is very enjoyable. And then, thankfully, I've got all these instructions, so I can slowly put them all together. This is the only part of the design, in fact, anything that I make, that uses 8mm wide acrylic. Why, I hear you cry. The slot that these two parts fit in is... Uh, 10 millimeters wide, so that just allows them. Let's switch all that noise off. So that just allows them to very nicely and handily fit with two spacing washers between them. And there's lots and lots of holes and tapping and drilling and all sorts with these. It's most enjoyable. Here's another top tip: little plate glass, um, tough, hardened, tough and plate glass thing that I got, I found somewhere or other. It's perfect because it's absolutely flat. I used to have a lovely old oval one from a very early television set that I took to pieces when I was very small, but I trod on it and it shattered. So I've got this, and it's great for sanding, because you put the uh, wet and dry or something on it, and it's absolutely flat, or equally for 
actually gluing things together at right angles because even this well this wooden table is awful because of all the work that's been done on it um lovely lovely v v block it means that i know when i stick this on with some super glue it will be absolutely vertical you can get a workshop some proper machine places and stuff have the huge marking out beds that are made of beautifully machined solid massive lumps of uh, cast iron but they're big, they're heavy, they're expensive, and this is absolutely fine. It is so delightful when a design, a purely functional design, ends up looking really interesting like this. It's got two lots of cams. One is horizontal, these are the star shape, that lifts the hammer back, sort of primes it, if you will. And around the centre there's these five other little uh, vertical cams that lift the hammer catch out of the way and let the hammer fall back down and as you can see there's the little slots for the elastic that support each chime so as this comes round regardless of direction as this cam passes underneath the catch it lifts it up and it can drop back and hit the chime that's suspended from there Oh, lovely, and that's all. That's all now set and everything. The other good thing about using glass is super glue doesn't stick to it very well, so you don't have to worry, as I have done on several occasions, assembling something on this beautiful top and then finding that you've got to chisel it off. Hmm. Right. Oh, that's just the brass bits. Just a little jig I made up to help me align them because poking these small vertical cams in, uh, yeah, it's whatever you call them, is uh, quite difficult otherwise. So that's great. Thanks very much for watching. Hope to see you next time. We'll have more exciting developments.